Hey, I'm back. Uh, I accidentally pressed the stop button, and I'm still new at this. I don't have time to edit it into one, so this is part two of the hippie movement. And let's pick up with Vietnam, okay? Uh, now, a lot of diverse groups protested the, the war, okay? African Americans, women, older parents, people that had been in World War II, and hippies, okay? Now, as I said before, one of the reasons that we see the hippies is because they did those things that were preposterous to many, okay? Uh, the first draft card burning that you have is in 1964, which they burned their draft cards because they didn't want to go to fight in Vietnam. And believe it, Vietnam was a quagmire. You're also going to see uh, women burning bras. And I myself believe that a bra represents oppression. They seem to me that they're incredibly uncomfortable to wear. And, you know, women, in order to be, you know, women or good women or nice women have to wear a bra. And I, I think, you know, if a woman wants to wear a bra because she wants to, that's her choice. But she shouldn't be made to wear a bra, and believe it or not. Um, Howard Hughes had a lot to do with the development of a bra because he didn't like the way his starlets looked on film, so he created a bra that would give them a more appealing uh, look uh, in their bust. And I think that's not a good thing, right? Now, it, it, President Johnson responds to the the card burning and he penalizes them with five years in prison or a thousand dollars, but they still did it. And you're also going to have Joan Fonda, you know, uh, hang around with the Viet Cong and that's not, that's not going to help. You know, that's, that's going to create some, some problems as well. So, uh, when we talk about the hippies, we think about Vietnam, we think about this muddy mess in Woodstock, which, which it was. I mean, half a million people at Woodstock, 1969, no bathrooms, there was no coordination. I mean, it, it's just been horrible, you know, then it rains. And so a, a lot of these individuals, eventually what they're going to do is that they're going to go back to, to college. And, and the core of the hippie philosophy uh, is going to remain there that they're going to figure it out pretty quick, that if they want to change policy, they're going to have to get into politics. And, you know, of course, you have people like Bernie Sanders, you know, old hippies, you know, that are still in the movement, you know. Uh, so that, in a sense, is, is going to do that. But they, they did have a lot of these hippies also joined in the Freedom Rides, in the sit-ins. Uh, they started SNCC, the Student Non-Violating uh, Nonviolence Coordinating Committee that's later going to become the Students for a Democratic Society, which becomes a little bit more clandestine. And then eventually a lot of those individuals are going to be a part of the Weather Underground. Well, that is a violent organization. You know, you're know, going to have Ted Kaczynski and individuals like that. And then they're going to go ahead and branch off. And from what I understand, what I've been told uh, and what I've read is that they're now, you know, parts of the people that started Anonymous, which participate in cyber hacking and stuff like that, vigilante cyber hacking and, and things like that. So these individuals uh, do become really clandestine and, and they become really sneaky, you know, like once it becomes a student for Democrat society, they are going to be singled out by Cointelpro, okay? That was an FBI organization, Cointelpro. Uh, I don't remember the whole big acronym, but it was an FBI uh, uh, organ that uh, was spearheaded, of course, by none other than J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, <laughs> I get a laugh because I had a professor that would say, by crossdresser extraordinaire, J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, and that would collect information on individuals that were subversive. Mexican-Americans like Jose Angel Gutierrez, uh, Willy Velasquez, uh, Rey Lopez Tijerina. I've seen some of these records. You know, they black out a bunch of stuff, but I've seen some of it. Joan Baez, The Grateful Dead. I mean, you name it. You know, uh, 
some individuals here were listed as the top 100 subversive. And the key word there was subversive because it was subject to interpretation. If you were subversive, they could basically pick you up. In the case of Willie Velasquez, from what I understand from watching one of his interviews, is that they arrested him and woke him up from his sleep and they arrested him and they said, uh, we're giving you 10 seconds to run. And he then knew that they wanted to shoot him. And he says, no, you put the handcuffs on me right now. I'm not going to run. Uh, so that in itself, the, the, the hippies weren't just out getting stoned, dropping acid. At some point, you have the individuals that stay with that, you know, and then you have the individuals that say, no, wait a minute. In order for me to make an impact, have an impact, is to go to school, become educated, and I can work in a different way to help uh, this situation. And that in itself becomes a, a very big part of the movement. Now, with all of that said, we, we begin to see movements again in Greenwich Village, and then we begin to see the movement go to San Francisco and Haight and Ashbury. You know, right around 67, I think, is when you begin to see the flower children, you know. And then, of course, in 1970, we're going to have Kent State, which is, you know, the protesting of the bombing of Cambodia um, where some students are shot at Kent State for, if my memory uh, serves me correctly. And in addition to that, uh, uh, the, the issue here is that this wasn't the first time that the National Guard had shot, you know, uh, young Americans. They had shot, <laughs> shot plenty of blacks and they had shot plenty of Mexican Americans. I laugh because, you know, it, it's really desensitizing in a sense that we'd already had the watch riots. Uh, later on, we're going to have the Chicano moratorium, you know, where uh, uh, Mexican-Americans are literally beaten to a pulp by uh, the San Diego Police Department. But the kids that were shot at Kent State were affluent white kids from upper middle class America and it and it happened on television and that was not anything that America was going to tolerate. You have troop escalation, you know, that's reached its peak. You have bombing of Cambodia, the war is spinning out of control. You know, Nixon, you know, you they don't trust him at all. So we've got this issue going on here. Now I'm not defending the National Guard, but I will say that the National Guardsmen were strung out because they had previously been at the Democratic National Convention. And somewhere I read that a lot of these guys had been jacked up on, on amphetamines. Uh, I don't know, maybe some kind of black molly pills or something like that. But I heard maybe uh, somebody watches this video and will comment on that. Again. I'm not, don't pretend to be a counterculture historian. I'm just telling you what I know about it, you know. And of course, you know, we're going to go into psychedelic rock. You know, Dr. Strange, you know, uh, the collective called the family dog, you know, uh, Jefferson Airplane, which is later on, it's going to become Jefferson Starship. You know, you have Carlos Santana. You know, Jimi Hendrix burning his guitar on stage, Janis Joplin. I always thought it was kind of, you know, weird because you had like Janis Joplin and John Lennon, you know, talking about, you know, a non industrial, non commercial capitalist society. I got an itch on my ankle. Uh, but they drove around in Rolls Royces, you know, I always thought that was kind of funny, you know, especially when um, John and Yoko do the, the, their, the bed festival, whatever it is that they did, but uh, they would call in the maids to clean up their mess. I always thought it was really funny. By the way, John Lennon is not my favorite Beatle uh, under any circumstances. It's, uh, uh, if you watch this video, and uh, you send me an email and tell, guess what, uh, Beetle is my favorite one. I'll give you five points uh, on exam four, okay? Okay, I'm back. I had to put some uh, 
insect repellent on my ankles because the mosquitoes were nipping at my ankles, okay? <laughs> so remember, you're going to get five points if you tell me who my favorite beetle is. All right. Hayton Ashbury, I think we've talked about that, you know, and I don't want to kind of just go on to this really big thing about just, you know. Now, uh, we will have two forms of music come out at this time. My notes, I uh, wrote down that in 1968, which is, of course, the most pivotal year in the United States, and read the section on 1968. We have the development of hard rock and reggae, which is on two opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, and also at this time, you begin to see the emergence of, not just yet, but you're going to see the emergence of punk rock. And, you know, uh, and then you're going to have some really cool groups like the Bad Brains and uh, the Clash. You know, I, I really believe that the Clash started the whole concept of punk rock with combat rock and you know and then of course you're gonna have um sid vicious and the sex pistols uh but that's that's you know getting to the, you know not really a big part of the hippie movement but it it stems out of that non-conformity that we're looking at and music is a very central you know it's a mantra of rock and dance um I have friends of mine uh, who, you know, like the idea of relieving stress through music, dancing, and art is a way to express yourself, and I firmly believe that, you know. Uh, you also have individuals such as uh, George Harrison going to India uh, and getting involved with, you know, the Maharajians. I hope I pronounced it right. I have a, a friend of mine that will correct me if I didn't. But what you're having here is that, you know, you begin to have these movements. You know, Summer of Love, New Communism, Farms. I mean, uh, you have when individuals having giving birth uh, in New York, in the New York sidewalk, and and I think for the most part, you know, really 1968 is a pivotal year for a lot of things in the United States, especially the hippie movement. I think after 68, you begin to have a decline, and I think that Kent State really puts an end to the hippie movement. I think that at that time, individuals who did not, uh, who were afraid of of the repercussions, say, you know what. We have to uh, stop, and we can combat this another way. Uh, 1968, uh, 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 65 is the end of the baby boomers, and I was born in 65, and uh, believe it or not, um, uh, I was born uh, right at the cutoff between the baby boomers and the generation X. I'm so glad that I was that I'm not a boomer. Thanks to my parents, they waited just a little bit longer. I'm not a boomer. Uh, and uh, one of the things uh, uh, was that they did in '68 was there's also Eugene McCarthy persuaded uh, individuals to get clean, you know, cut your hair. You see those pictures of. Bill Clinton with a bunch of big beards and stuff like that. Stay out of the media spotlight. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's how you doing, little kitty? Maybe little kitty will show you up. Uh, beginning in 68, you, you, you know, you begin to see, and get out of the way. In, in beginning in 68, you begin to see the rise of the yippies, okay? And from then on, you know, I can go on and on and on and on about the hippie movement. But just remember that it is a lasting impact, okay? Uh, don't pay attention to the cat's tail there. Uh, we have the development of the miniskirt, right? They develop the miniskirt, so they want to go ahead and uh, that is uh, um, a way of protesting. And the first miniskirt, basically what somebody did, I, I used to remember her name. Um, but she cut, uh, she cut the shorts into basically into a pair of Daisy Dukes and then she just unseamed the crotch and that's how, 
a miniskirt was born. It is rumored that the original movie, uh, the, the original, uh, um, ah, the original miniskirt is actually a Smithsonian. Okay, I can't close without talking about Woodstock West, where the Rolling Stones, and Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, and other bands performed. Of course, the Hell's Angels were security, and uh, there was a couple of. Uh, I think there was a person that was stabbed, uh, and there was actually <laughs> four accidental births and four accidental deaths and four accidental births at Woodstock West. So I know that I was kind of all over the place with this, uh, but I just, you know, that's the way the hippie movement was. Monterey Music Festival, all that neat kind of stuff. Did they have a lasting impact? They did, but it wasn't it wasn't something that you could say that it was as lasting an impact as the African-American civil rights movement. There's actually a really good South Park episode about Woodstock and the hippie movement. And eventually what happens is that regardless of what you think, you can't party forever. You will get tired of partying and then you realize that, oh my God, I have to be like my parents. And I always tell my students, the day when it's over for us adults, it's a day that you start buying clothing for comfort and not for looks. And I've already reached that. So some of you students have said, oh my God, Mr. Reed, those are horrible shoes. I said, yeah, but they're so comfortable. Yeah, so believe it or not, and as I always tell you, one of the reasons that your parents are sometimes always pissed off is because they got to work, 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 and all the responsibility falls on them, and then they have to support you. <laughs> okay. So I hope that this is uh, helped. I'm going to come up with the women's movement here in a little bit and then the American Indian movement. And then I may do a snippet on 68. I don't know yet. Okay, but you all take care. Be kind to each other. And I don't know what else. Am I missing anything? Now I'm going to go get me something to eat. Uh, and I will talk to you all later. Take care.